So a, a warm uh, uh, welcome to all the people who have joined us online on YouTube, YouTube as well as on ICTS channel. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium and ICTS uh, uh, Bengaluru. Uh, this edition of Coffee uh, with Curiosity uh, is doubly interesting. Uh, first of all, uh, it's Professor Rohini Godbare who is uh, giving this talk. And the topic that she has uh, selected, Symmetries of Nature and Nature of Symmetries, is a topic that is very close to her uh, field of research, as well as for those who would like to look at uh, uh, the concept of symmetries uh, in a popular, uh, at a popular level. And what I liked about the talk, uh, the title of the talk, is that the title itself is uh, symmetrical about uh, bilaterally symmetrical. So, <laughs> symmetries of nature and nature of symmetries. If you read either from left to right or right to left, it means the same. So, uh, that shows her creativity in uh, putting the title together. So, once again, I welcome you all. And uh, with no further delay, uh, we will have the introduction of the speaker, uh, followed by uh, by the talk, uh, which we are all eagerly looking forward to. Thank you very much. And Dr. Sarajesh Gopakumar. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Madhusudan. Uh, uh, please welcome everyone uh, to another edition of our online version of copy with curiosity and uh, since uh, we cannot serve you copy we are at least serving you curiosity uh, uh, so at least trying to slake your uh, curiosity uh, so it, it, this uh, has been uh, uh, getting a good response uh, the curiosity during quarantine avatar uh, and uh, um, it's a pleasure to start uh, the new year with uh, Professor Rohini Godbule. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, Professor Samuel will give a formal introduction to her, but I'm very happy that actually she's uh, doing, uh, giving this talk uh, here, uh, very closely following on the heels of uh, a, a very nice recognition that she recently received. One of the uh, rec uh, one of the uh, uh, recognitions given by the French government uh, to uh, 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 citizens outside France, uh, order the merit. Uh, uh, so uh, congratulations, uh, Rohini, for receiving a uh, prestigious uh, 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 award and from an uh, uh, from a, a government outside India. She's, of course, also received the Padma Shri from the government of India. Uh, so it's a, it's a great pleasure. She is an inspiration to many uh, younger physicists, and I hope uh, today's talk will uh, give, uh, give you an idea of why and uh, will inspire you to, uh, uh, to also look more into the topic that she is uh, going to talk about. Um, many of you know about ICTS, so I will not repeat uh, very much, but uh, uh, I, um, uh, I would encourage people who are here for the first time to look at our webpage. We have a lot of outreach activities, uh, uh, apart from our own research and program activities. Uh, so you can watch uh, previous episodes of uh, uh, this series on our YouTube channel called ICTS Talks. You can, uh, we also have started a new uh, series called Vigyan Adda, which is a sort of a very informal interaction talk for undergraduates. Uh, and uh, we'll be soon having, um, announcing uh, further episodes of that. So please stay tuned. You can also subscribe, uh, like in the chat message uh, says, you can subscribe to our outreach email uh, emails and get to know about uh, the events that are uh, upcoming. So um, uh, it's a pleasure to also collaborate with the planetarium on this. And I hope uh, now with, in this new year, uh, given that things are looking up, uh, I hope they will continue this way. And perhaps towards the latter half of uh, this year, we will feel comfortable in going back to the physical avatar of uh, Copy with Curiosity, uh, which uh, uh, of course has its own uh, unique uh, uh, um, uh, 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 
jump to it because of being able to talk at length even afterwards with the speaker and so on. Uh, but uh, this uh, online avatar allows many people from outside Bangalore to attend, so that's another positive uh, thing. So uh, in any case, uh, let me uh, now hand it over to uh, Professor Samuel, who will formally introduce the speaker and uh, look forward to the talk. Okay, uh, Sam. Thank you, Rajesh, and thank you, Madhusudan. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Rohini Godbole from the Center for High Energy Physics at the Institute of Science. Now, Rohini's area of interest is particle physics, which explores the microscopic structure of the constituents of subnuclear matter, quarks, gluons, leptons, and so on. As many of you know, probing smaller scales requires higher energies. And this gives the name to the field of high energy physics. Symmetries and, and symmetry breaking have been particularly fruitful in understanding the fundamental constituents of matter. There is now a standard mod model of particle physics, which imposes order and symmetry on the zoo of particles discovered in particle accelerators. More recently, cracks have begun to appear in this once imposing edifice, calling for physics beyond the standard model. Rohini's work spans both the standard model and physics beyond the standard model. One of her books is on supersymmetry, an elegant theoretical idea, which blurs the distinction between fermions and bosons. Rohini is a regular visitor to the European Center for Nuclear Research and her work has influenced the design of the next generation of colliders. Her work in particle physics has been well recognized. Of the numerous honors she has received, I will mention just two, and uh, Rajesh already told you about them, the Padma Shri from the Indian government and the French Order of Merit. Apart from her research, Rohini is passionate about the cause of women in science. One of her books is titled Nilavati's Daughters, and this is a collection of profiles of Indian women scientists. Rohini is a high energy physicist in more than one sense of the term. Even after expending a good fraction of her energy smashing protons together, she still has enough left over to enthusiastically explain her work to all comers. She's an excellent science communicator, and you are in for a treat today. I'll just say a word about the practical matter of questions. Uh, if you have any questions to ask during the talk, please enter them in the chat. The ICTS audiovisual team will be monitoring the chat. So as not to interrupt the speaker's flow, we will ask most of the questions at the end of the talk, barring of course clarifications, which cannot wait for the end. Let me now hand you over to Professor Rohini Godbole. Thank you very much. First, let me thank ICTS, and that means all these, uh, which is luckily most of them are old and dear friends, for asking me to give this talk. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure in uh, to try to do this, particularly in these days of quarantine and isolation. It's always good when friends introduce you because they glorify you much more than what you are. So thanks, Sam, for this really nice introduction. So today, I want to tell you about symmetries of nature and nature of symmetries. So already this was uh, mentioned that this particular set of meetings used to be called, are, are actually a reincarnation, so to say, an avatar of copy with curiosity has become curiosity during quarantine. So KWK has gone into KDK. So if you wish, under the pandemic, the KWK has transformed into KDK, but it's a symmetry because the lectures in the new avatar or the old avatar attract the same and similar audience, my barring minor differences. So the symmetry exists 
and the symmetry is slightly broken too. So let's see what we are going to talk about. I would try to really focus this talk on three different uh, points. And I'm not sure whether they will really, I will follow this order. But what I want to tell you is three things. One is, what do we mean by symmetry? So that means, you know, symmetry and invariance and all of that. Then I would want to also spend some time on symmetry and invariance and conservation laws, which is a really a very, very important contribution by the famous mathematician, Amy Noether. And then I would like to talk, spend some time on things that have occupied the particle physics community maybe for quite a few decades, and that is symmetry breaking and what I call hits and all that. I should tell you at the outset that symmetry as an idea transcends all subject matters and there will be a mathematician will have a different way of talking to you about it. A physicist, even a particle physicist and a condensed matter physicist will look at it and find something new from each angle, the biologist, the chemist, so what you're going to get here is mostly a physicist's outlook, but I will try to give you some examples from biology and chemistry as well. So first I already, my friend Madhusudana commented on the title of the lecture. So I thought I will try to tell you why I chose this title or I, why I constructed this title. So symmetries of nature, what I like to think are these many natural, you know, we know that many naturally occurring patterns in nature are symmetric. We all also know that symmetric things are beautiful. And we also know on authority of Aristotle, Einstein or Subramaniam Chandrasekhar, that truth of nature, truths of nature are always beautiful. Therefore, the hunt for symmetries of laws of nature has actually, it's not a surprise that this hunt has led us to uncover the truth about the laws of nature. And it is this point that I want to try and sort of convey qualitatively to you. So I have symmetries of nature. What do I mean by that? Once again, at two types of things. One is the symmetries of patterns, of shapes, or whatever we see, observe in nature all around us. And the second symmetry of nature that I refer to is the equations which encapsulate laws of nature governing the, that the you know, laws of nature which govern the physical world, the properties that the physical world exhibits. And nature of symmetries, I like to think, are the mathematical framework to describe the symmetry in terms of some things remaining similar, same, unchanged, and as time goes by through the talk, I will sort of clarify or expand on these concepts. But the mathematical framework which describes this symmetry in terms of things remaining the same under some specific operations, that mathematical framework, which was essentially uh, began, which began uh, in a big way uh, among others, but the one that I ref, uh, sort of look at was uh, the mathematician Galva, who looked at, I will come back, come to it what he did. So let's leave it at that. But that since many people might actually know this mathematical framework, which is of a lot of importance is the essentially group theory. But in what sense things remain the same? This is what the giant of mathematics, Amy Noether, she showed us. And in fact, in the 20th century hall of fame of men in mathematics, Amy Noether's portrait was the only female portrait to be hanging there. And this was way before the ideas about inclusivity and what have you exploded. This lady, I mean, to be honest, when I learned, I know every theoretical physicist swears by Noether's theorem. And I, it, I find that it was actually I feel really sorry for myself that I didn't know growing up that the Noether's theorem is by Amy Noether, that it's a woman who wrote that theorem. Anyway, this particular theorem is an absolute uh, godsend to theoretical physicists 
because it helped theoretical physicists, both particle physicists, condensed matter physicists, to uncover many a secrets of nature. So let's try to understand. So in some sense, you know, what I want to show you is that nature of understanding nature of symmetries has helped us to uncover symmetries of nature. So it's like almost like a snake eating its and biting its tail. So in general, symmetry is very simple to understand and also very profound, both at the same time. We know that symmetries can be put to very practical use, such as, you know, when we take planes, we have devices, which we divide, it's very easy or much more simpler to define devices, devise devices, which are left, right, symmetrical. Imagine if you are wanting to uh, make a plane, then it is much easier to design it left, right, symmetrical, and that would have a much better chance of floating in un un uh, uncertain conditions. Symmetry also produces things of beauty, which please our eye, our mind, in art, such as painting, such as music. Actually, symmetry is also seen in animal kingdom. I will have some occasion to talk about it a little bit, but for example, we find that the animals like us, which are, which are two-legged, are uh, lateral symmetric, whereas the four-legged uh, animals are front, back and front symmetric quite often, unless you happen to be a marsupial and a kangaroo, which has two very small legs and back legs, which are very long. So symmetry is everywhere around us. And the point that is the topic of this lecture mostly is how symmetry ideas have provided a clarity to our scientific thinking and how they have lit up for future explorations of the truths of nature. So, you know, things that are symmetric are quite often quite beautiful. So one can ask a question because I said here, explorations of the truths of nature. So actually you can ask, is truth always beautiful? We can have it on good authority. John Keats, you know, Ode on a Gracian Urn, he said, beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Actually, if we begin from Aristotle, he said, nature always chooses the best option. The chief forms of beauty are order and symmetry and definiteness, which the mathematical sciences demonstrate in a spatial degree, which is, uh, I mean, considerations of symmetry in mathematics are yet another level of abstraction than the consideration of symmetry in physics. For example, Hermann Wanti, he was talking about Einstein and uh, he said, what I remember most clearly was that when I put down a suggestion, Wanti was a cosmologist, okay? And he would be, he worked with Einstein and he said that when I put down a suggestion that seemed to be cogent and reasonable, Einstein did not in the least contest it, but he only said, oh, how ugly. As long as an equation seemed to be to him ugly, he really rather lost interest in it and could not understand why somebody else was willing to spend much time on it. He was quite convinced that beauty was a guiding principle in the search for important results in theoretical physics. The Her Herman Weil, who was a, another doyen of uh, physics and mathematics, and he actually, I would say, set up the entire concept of use of symmetries in physics. He said, I always try to unite truth with the beautiful, but when I had to choose one or the other, I always chose beautiful. As Chandrasekhar, our own Subramaniam Chandrasekhar has actually written a very nice book and aesthetics and motivations in science that is titled Truth and Beauty. So this is all to tell you that People who are in search of secrets of nature have always thought, beginning from Aristotle, that beauty is perhaps a good pointer towards truth and symmetry is a good, you know, it provides you that beauty, hence this importance of symmetry for underlying truths of nature. In fact, Already it was mentioned by Sam that a discussion of symmetries and realizing 
how understanding symmetries have driven our search at the heart of matters. Supposing I try to give this discussion completely, it will cover almost the all of the 20th century theoretical physics, and it will also co co cover very some very important mathematical developments. And in fact, I would say that the consideration of symmetries and their mathematical description is actually a subject where the intertwining threads of all branches of sciences, theoretical physics, biology, chemistry, and fundamental mathematics are extremely obvious. And particularly for particle theory, the development would have been impossible without our understanding of symmetries and how to describe them mathematically. So Harman Weil is the father who helped us help the particle physicists see the you know the language of group theory and he said symmetry is a vast subject it's significant in art and nature mathematics lies at its root and it would be hard to find a better one on which to demonstrate the working of mathematical intellect i'm just trying to tell you how this big doyens of physics mathematics what did they think about symmetry then these are the uh, two other players, Poincaré and Einstein. Uh, Poincaré actually discovered special theory of relativity, along, arrived at special theory of relativity, and so did Einstein. And Einstein actually also arrived at general theory of relativity. And I would say this is a very concrete example where symmetries and invariances were used to understand something about observed laws of nature in electrodynamics, which I will talk a little bit later, and also arrive at a theory which nobody had thought about, and that's the general theory of relativity. Wigner, who is the most important player for physics, at least I would say, he was actually given the Nobel Prize in uh, 1963. And if you look at his citation, it says, for his contribution to the theory of the atomic nucleus and the elementary particles, particularly through the discovery and application of fundamental symmetry principles. So he was the father of the mathematical machinery, and he was the major player which changed the attitudes of physicists toward the symmetry and the major mathematical tool that was available, namely group theory. So now we have got sort of some idea about the major players. Now I want to make a few generic statements that many of us in popular talking, as well as in scientific talking, we use the word symmetry in many, many different ways. I already told you what Aristotle said, that the chief forms of beauty in nature are order, symmetry, and definiteness. So for him, symmetry was a form of beauty. Symmetry and philosophy. Harman Weil went, to say, went on to say, symmetry is one idea through the ages that human being has tried to comprehend and create order, beauty, and perfection. Then there has been platonic solids, that is shapes which look the same under moving, under rotating, under reflecting around an axis. And human beings actually have engaged themselves in looking at you know, symmetries of shapes under these different operations almost since the time of the Babylonians and perhaps even before. And then comes the most recent one that I want to talk about, that is the symmetries of law of nature. Scientists began by encapsulating the observed facts about nature in few equations. And one can talk about equations of motion, of Newton's equations of motion, one can talk about Faraday's law, one can talk about laws which were first understood, for example, Faraday's law and the other laws of electromagnetism, it were derived from observations. And then suddenly people realized, not suddenly because mathematical ideas were developing, people realized that these equations actually possess certain symmetries. And then one has an understanding why the laws of nature are what they are. So abstracting these symmetries from the particular situation where they were observed actually paved the way for deciphering the laws of nature where we didn't know anything about it. And this last sentence that I'm making is actually the most complex of them all. And hopefully we will get some understanding of this as we go along. And last but not the least, 
the symmetries and constancy or invariance or conservation of quantities. The symmetries imply constancy of measurable quantities that are associated with a system. And the correspondence is two ways. If the symmetry exists, the quantities are conserved. And if the quantities are conserved, we can infer about the symmetries of a system. So this is really what I can say as the general statements about symmetries that one can make. So according to Wigner, the symmetries of laws of nature were of two types. One, what he called geometrical symmetries, that is space-time symmetries. And I will explain what these space-time symmetries are in another slide or two. And the second one, what he called, were the dynamical symmetries. And these are the bread butter of nuclear physicists, particle physicists, and in general, theoretical physicists. So actually, these second class of symmetries were actually inferred and postulated from observed patterns in the properties. Already Sam referred to one of them, that the two of particles that was observed in the set of experiments actually fell into place once one understood that these could be classified and some patterns and those patterns indicated certain underlying symmetries which produced these uh, bound states of different particles that one was observing. And using the mathematical framework that one had developed to understand these kinematic symmetries, in fact, the space-time symmetries, paved the way in next time later to imagine these alternative, the newer in, internal invisible symmetries, the world of the unobservables. And since we were, when we were, the, when these symmetries that we are talking about, the dynamical symmetries that the nuclear physicists, the particle physicists, or in general, any theoretical physicist uses, actually are happening at you know, governing laws at distant scales, which are either much smaller or much bigger than us. And it is when we don't have, when there is such a big scale difference, actually it's quite nice to be able to trust the messages that are given to us by these abstract ideas, which were developed to explain the symmetries that we could we had seen in our uh, scales of distances that are of our own. So what is a symmetry? A symmetry is an operation or a transformation that you perform that leaves a particular object unchanged, invariant, same or similar. Let me try to give you some examples. So this is a bit tongue in chuck, but for example, here is my student Gauro, and he came to visit me last year with his little daughter Kavya. And here is Gauro feeding Kavya, and here is Kavya feeding Gauro. So the group of these two pictures are actually symmetric under an exchange of two people, Gaurav and Kavya. So this is an exchange symmetry, if you wish. Let me, let me be a little more serious. Let me look at this face, the uh, shape that is here on the left side of the page. If I rotate this shape through 90 degrees, actually the point that I have labeled A will go here. But actually, if I had, if I didn't put the number number A here, the letter A here. And if I just had this figure without the uh, letter A, I close my eyes, somebody rotated the piece of paper and I opened my eyes, I won't be able to see the difference. So this rotation through 90 degrees is a symmetry of this particular shape. Again, now sometimes the symmetries in this case, for example, is a symmetry rotation through 90 degrees is a symmetry. Further rotation through another 90 degrees is also a symmetry. But if I rotate this shape only through 45 degrees and open my eyes, it's a paper rotated only through 45 degrees, I'll be able to see this difference. And so therefore, this particular symmetry that we are talking about are symmetries of an object, of a shape, when you rotate through discrete angles. But supposing I had a circle which was drawn on a piece of paper. And again, I close my eyes and somebody sitting uh, in front of me rotates the paper any which way he or she likes. If I cannot see the sh shape of the paper, how the, you know, if I only see this circle, 
I'm not going to be able to see that this thing has been rotated unless I put markers. So what earlier I was calling A would have gone to a new point A prime. But if I didn't mark anything, if I didn't put any mark, the circle looks exactly the same. So these are continuous rotations. I can have rotations to any angle I wish. Here, the symmetry is only under rotations through some fixed angles. For example, these are geometric examples of geometrical symmetric shapes. This is a circle, this is a sphere, or these are the famous platonic solids. That is the cube, which most of us learn in our uh, schools and get completely, end up getting sometimes completely terrified or confused and the good old prism and so on and so forth. And this platonic solids, for example, which were listed by Plato himself, these were known since before Christ. So these are the same platonic solids, once again, a bigger sort of more uh, bigger version of them to see, for example, this cube has many, many symmetries. It can rotate about the uh, axis, which is going through the center of the cube. It can be rotated around an axis to the center of the cube, perpendicular a bisector of these sides, a bisector of this side. So there are various symmetries that this uh, cube possesses. Similarly, various symmetries that this uh, prism possesses. And these are all symmetries through fixed angles of rotation. For example, I told you that many of the objects in nature are symmetric and that makes them really beautiful. For example, look at it here, butterfly. This is a left-right symmetric butterfly. This is an emperor, I think. And then there is this snowflake, which has a six-fold naturally occurring symmetry. Now, people actually work very hard now to try and understand why snowflakes have this symmetry. But in life, in nature, these symmetric objects do exist, and they are some of the most beautiful objects we behold. Not only that, Leonardo da Vinci, when he was painting the ideal human body proportions, some of you may have seen this, then you see the symmetry of this particular body and his ideal body was always very symmetric. Now, for example, let me take the same that I did earlier. And I, if I take this shape, I rotate it to 90 degrees. I told you I will not be able to see the difference. But if I reflect it in a mirror, then I will see that this shape I can distinguish from this shape. So rotation through 90 degrees is a symmetry of this shape, but mirror reflection is not a symmetry of this shape. On the other hand, for example, this is a picture of the good old uh, Taj Mahal. And if we zoom in, we will be able to see there are so many different symmetries in different panels here, different friezes here. And you know, for example, if I were to rotate this whole structure, then also there are symmetries so on and so forth. If I were to look at reflection around this in a mirror, you will notice that this freeze and this freeze are completely symmetric, completely the same. So this shape is very beautiful, very pleasing, has a lot of symmetries in it. You know, for example, this is uh, one of the figures uh, from uh, one of the temples, Chola temples, I think. And you will see a wonderful uh, bilateral uh, left-right symmetry in this picture, for example, even these things are completely symmetric. Then this is the famous Konark temple, where again you see that there is a wheel here, and this wheel is symmetric under a rotation through 45 degrees, except I have to neglect these eight different figures. They are eight different uh, women uh, uh, in different, different positions. So if I neglect that difference, then this has a complete symmetry and a rotation through 45 degrees. In, uh, in our churches, our temples, our mosques, for example, we will see that the same pattern repeats again and again. I already pointed that out in the case of Taj Mahal. This is the third symmetry, namely translational symmetry. So this is a symmetry under, you know, the pattern repeats. For example, this pattern repeats in this direction, okay? Then this pattern repeats in this direction. The distance between this, this, and this is exactly the same, and the pattern keeps on repeating. So this sodium chloride crystal, in fact, has a translational symmetry. And in fact, this translational symmetry goes a long way in giving, endowing the crystal with a lot of properties 
that we actually observe. Then there is yet another type of symmetry that we see in naturally occurring objects. And what is that? That's a symmetry in a shell. Symmetry here is that of a translation, a rotation, and a scaling. Okay. So you see here that naturally occurring objects really do come and exhibit all kinds of symmetries. Man-made objects, art, again display a whole lot of symmetries. Now I come to a tree which is peculiar only to mathematicians. And this was the one that I said about, I refer to as work of Galois. So Galois is the person who actually started studying symmetries of equations. So these equations need not even de describe anything physical, but he just looked at the roots of a polynomial. Now, for example, if you look at a quadratic equation, all of us know how to solve it. At least we learned in school how to do it. And the product of N, uh, two roots, one thing we know for sure, it's always C by A. And this we know without knowing the two roots. Now, Galois kind of asked a question, let us look at the permutations of these roots, which will leave these relationships unchanged. And considering the properties of such operations, he was able to answer, which is wonder of wonders, why some quintic equations can be solved analytically and a solution can be obtained and why some cannot. So a mathematicians look at symmetries is yet another story, completely different and very, very fundamental and abstract. For example, I talked briefly about a reflection symmetry, because if you look at this, let me go back here for a second. I said that here mirror reflection did not reproduce the same figure. Other way I can think of when I change left to R, when I take a mirror reflection, I change left to R. So then you can ask yourself a question, I define absolutely left and right. So actually, if you start thinking about it, the choice of right and left is actually pretty arbitrary. Only when we define a particular direction, for example, on the earth, we can define that up is different than down because down is the direction where we get attracted to the earth. So if we have that sense of direction, then one can immediately define a left or right by saying that the rotation, the, the sense, the right will be the sense in which I rotate a screw such that it will move it upwards and left is the opposite to the sense of rotation. So therefore, this particular choice of having a direction that allows me to define right and left, okay? But if I reverse, if instead of choosing the up as a good direction, I decided to choose that direction as downwards, it would have changed my concept of right and left. But actually in animal kingdom, very often we see left-right symmetric shapes. We see biological shapes which are left-right symmetric. Our own body is left-right symmetric. And this has to do, you know, there is a very nice discussion of this in uh, Herman Weil's essay on symmetry, where he actually goes on to argue that the development of shapes into left-right symmetric uh, bodies is due to the fact that the effect of gravitation as well as direction of motion, which are animals which are capable of motion, up, down, forward, backward, is when L and R remains arbitrary. Actually, Kant and Leibniz even had a philosophical discussion about right and left. And philosophically, right as defined the way I have said with the sense of rotation of the screw was always considered right. And the word for left in Latin was sinister. That means left was not right, okay? So anyway, this is, I don't want to go just for fun. I mentioned this left and right. But if you look, this concept of handedness, you know, it's very important in physics, it plays an important role in everything, physics, chemistry, and biology. For example, in nature, sometimes we see shells. I have given you example of the shell earlier with only one handedness. And sometimes we see them with both handedness, but most common are one handedness. In fact, amino acids can have two inequivalent isomers with opposite handedness. And chemically, both can be synthesized in the lab. These are example of two such amino, uh, amino isomers. One is left-handed and one is right-handed. And that has to just do with the stereochemistry of this particular uh, molecule. Both are stable by calculations, theoretical calculations to tell you that both are stable arrangements. 
chemically you can synthesize them that's why you can synthesize them and you will find that both can be synthesized in the lab but in animals in life on earth in proteins there are only l amino acids so you know that's a that's something that has actually worried people uh, this is about left and right in fact casimir the famous famous physicist casimir once published a paper in nature showing that the cows either chew by their they in charge either in a left circular motion or right circular motion or there was a very famous indian student of uh, j b halden his name was t a davis and he found that the leaves of coconut tree arrange themselves either clockwise or anti clockwise there are two separate sets and one of the two i forget which one at this point one of them had higher yield than the other so he said okay if i want to have more coconuts i should try to grow the ones which give me the higher yield but i can figure that out by looking at how they arrange uh, their leaves so i don't have to wait for 10 years to see what the yield is as a matter of fact we know that the left right symmetry in some sense broken even among bipeds 10% people in the world are left handed that is the left hand is dominant for those of you who are interested in cricket you will remember that a captain always loves to have a left right combination of batsman batting at the same time in fact just in a lighter way let me go back to the last australia versus india match the net result was india won okay our left to right transformation left handed to right handed batting which from rishabh pant to washington sundar both of them were essential for our victory so we can say that the result that we won india uh, the match is invariant under this transformation but in case of the transformation of rishabh pant to uh, chetan Puj uh, cheteshwar pujara the left to right transformation will have to be accompanied in addition by an aggressive to defensive batting as well so invariances can be a complicated story and you have to have sometimes invariances under a common action of two different transformations rather than a single transformation anyway back to the business at hand which is somewhat more serious so now let me go back to this statement here that i made that in nature you have amino acids in proteins which are only left amino acids so you can ask a question the fact that the proteins have only left amino acids is an indicative of some symmetry breaking somewhere so actually as long as both the amino acids can be chemically synthesized as long as energetics calculations does not prefer left over right either or right, right over left then the absurd prevalence of a particular handedness may be only due to what is called a self reinforcing process and i will just come to that by giving you an example but this clearly does not say that laws of physics forbid it and in that sense this symmetry left right symmetry is not it is not a indication of breaking of left right symmetry so let me try to give you an example of this this is something that uh, people who do behavioral studies have noticed it for a long time that if you know ants are traveling and then you know there comes a fork in the road and then one ant the leader goes in one direction after that every ant which comes after that follows the ant which has taken the left fork if the that ant had taken a light right fork every single ant would have gone to the right so this means that uh, this is sort of an accidental breaking of the symmetry or what i call the self reinforcing processes now actually evolutionary biologists and uh, very often even the chemists and you know sci scientists do worry about such things uh, in development of patterns in development of shapes in for example uh, why proteins li uh, in life are all left handed people worry about these things and sometimes people even try to postulate whether the left handedness of all the amino acids has something to do with the uh, left right symmetry breaking in the weak interactions of particle physics about which something will come more later but all i am trying to show you here is that this symmetry a lack of symmetry is not symmetry so if this lack of symmetry is not symmetry breaking then what oh before i that i want to tell you that this differences can be actually very dangerous even though i told you that this was birthed by chance this happened 
Now the differences between left and right-handed compounds can be actually pretty lethal on organic systems. The L-glucose cannot be used by the body. And in fact, what happened, that is a famous story when I was young, thalidomide, there was a particular medicine and this was chemically synthesized sample contains both L and R molecules. And initially the laboratory tests were done only with one isomer, which is produced by organisms. So had only one of the isomers. And when the tests were made, patient, uh, the, like we are getting familiar every day with the tests of the vaccine, of course, any medicine that is to be proposed, one has to make uh, real life tests. And those field tests were successful because people had used an isomer that was only produced by the organisms. But when it was uh, chemically synthesized, and then it was given in tablets, it actually caused uh, the babies being born with deformation. And it took quite some time to unravel this mystery. So the left-right differences can be pretty dangerous. But since I said that this left-right difference is not what I would call symmetry breaking, then what is a symmetry breaking? So I would give you an example that you know, most of us know about electrons, so I don't have to introduce the entire world of particles to uh, use the word electron. And we also know that the electron carries a spin. I mean, this is something we learn in our 10th or 12th. So this is a concept that is somewhere there in our minds. And somewhere that we also know that the principles of quantum mechanics told us that the spin that is associated with an electron in units of the Planck's constant h cross is half, which means that it can have a projection on an arbitrary z direction, either plus half or minus half. So I can define a right-handed electron and a left-handed electron as a electro as two states of the same electron, one which has a spin parallel to the direction of motion, I will call it right-handed, and one which is anti-parallel to its direction of motion, I will call it left-handed. Now, if you take a right-handed electron, okay, and you take a mirror reflection, actually in a mirror, then you have to uh, see, see that a right-handed electron will actually go into a left-handed electron. Now, this also does not really cause any problems, except for the fact that in beta decays, which are all we know radioactive beta decays, where electrons are emitted by nuclei when they are uh, decaying from one nucleus to another nucleus, at that time, the beta decays, all the electrons that come to life in beta decays are all left-handed. Whereas if the same electron and positron is seen somewhere else, you find equal number of right-handed and left-handed electrons. So this is indeed a breaking of left-right symmetry. And this breaking of the symmetry has actually had very important consequences on our development of theories of fundamental particle physics. So therefore, at this point, all I want to point out is that symmetry and its breaking are both very, very important. Actually, in this context, I can also say that, for example, in solids, defects which break the symmetry of the arrangements, I know I showed you the sodium chloride uh, crystal. So if there are defects, then they break the symmetry of these arrangements. But actually, they can change the material properties completely. And this doping of a material by an additional material, which actually changes the symmetry of arrangement, this can be used to manipulate the material properties at will almost. So this is also a symmetry breaking, but it's an explicit symmetry breaking, which we have introduced by hand and we change the situation and the physics that is happening of the system. So what are the reasons for this symmetry breaking, both for symmetry and symmetry breaking? This is what one wants to discuss. So I again appeal to some very famous physicists and one of them is Richard Feynman. Uh, he actually sort of uh, gives, he has an article on symmetry. So he said, our problem is to explain where symmetry comes from. Why is the nature so nearly symmetric? No one really has any idea why. The only thing we might suggest is something like this. And I've got to show you the, maybe I'll show you first. So he talks about a gate in Japan. It's a gate in Nikko, 
and it's called by the Japanese the most beautiful gate in all Japan. Let me show you the picture of that gate. So this is this most beautiful gate in Japan. <coughs> and then he says that when one looks closely, one sees that in the elaborate and the complex design along one of the pillars, one of the small design elements is carved upside down. Otherwise, the thing is completely symmetrical. Let me show you that. So these are, this is the you know, close up of the same sculpture in that uh, temple. And here you see that there are many pillars. And for example, all the pillars are like B, where the design is what is given here. The pattern is like this here, which is all symmetric, symmetric, symmetric. But when you come to A, in A pal pillar, actually the design is not symmetric. For example, here you see the difference. Here, uh, uh, the arrangement is this down, this down, this down, this down. Whereas here, this is uh, suddenly the order has changed. And that is the one is upside down and one is downside up. So this is the asymmetry as you see in these pillars. So why were the, why the thing was not completely symmetric? So the Japanese say, that they purposely put an error there so that the gods would not be jealous and get angry with the human beings because God is the only entity that is allowed to be perfect. So actually Feynman wanted to turn this idea around and he said the true explanation of the near symmetry of the nature is this, that God made the laws only nearly symmetrical so that we should not be jealous of his perfection. So to my mind, I mean, it's a poetic way of explaining the importance of asymmetries also to the symmetries that we are talking about. That is the symmetry and symmetry breaking, both are very important concepts. Okay. So what did I summarize? Let me just take a short breath and say, what did I say so far? I said that if a system is changed by an operation, we call that operation a symmetry of the system. We discussed mainly static symmetries of bodies, shapes, designs, except in the last case of LR symmetry, we found this is not a static symmetry, but it's just a slightly different symmetry. Then we also discussed translations of space and time through a fixed distance, that's the translational symmetry, rotation of coordinates to a fixed number of angles or called continuous rotations, and a reflection in mirror. Now, in fact, these are the three types of symmetries that the equations which describe motions of particles or system of particles exhibit. Since the physical laws are extracted from a large amount of data on time evolution of physical systems from a set of given initial conditions, these laws of nature or laws of physics are extracted from the data and they are independent of the place where we perform the experiment. They are independent of the time period where we perform the experiment. And therefore, the one and two, that is the translation of origin of space and time through a fixed distance and rotation of coordinates to a fixed number of angles or continuous rotations must be symmetries of the laws of motion. And the physical space, as it is, I already discussed with you, cannot distinguish between left and right, but some physics phenomena like the beta decay emitting only the left-handed electron may provide a way if, if, uh, if that can distinguish left from the right. So let me just go back and this is, I promise you, this is only one of the two equations that I will write. So let us look at how logics look when one changes the choice of origin of space and time or orientation of coordinate axis. The space by itself does not distinguish any one point as spatial. Now let me write down Newton's second law of motion, which says that mass into acceleration is force. And acceleration is nothing but rate of change of velocity. And rate of change of velocity and velocity is rate of change of distance. Therefore, this is m times the mass times second derivative of the distance with respect to time is the force. And in vector notation, I can write it like this. But now if you actually work out the, uh, these equations, you will find that they look the same under rotation or tra translation. That is, if I do change the coordinate origin, Clearly, this is not going to change. If I change uh, the uh, orientation of the coordinate axis, 
again the equation will not change what i call x what i call y and what i call z might change but the equation will retain its form so what does it mean for physics for physics what it means is that i can calculate the orbit of the earth around the sun i can choose one set of axes i can choose one origin of space and time i can compute this now somebody else sam tomorrow says that i don't like your coordinate choice i will rotate my coordinate axis and his coordinate axis are rotated with respect to mine so as i already told you that a circle was the perfect thing which was invariant under a rotation of coordinates so greek actually initially thought that because of that the orbit should be circular but that's not the case actually what rotational invariance tells us is that it does not say that the orbit should be necessarily circular they can be if under certain circumstances but what it tells us that the relative orientation of the sun and the earth will be the same no matter what the orientation of the observer's coordinate axis is all you will have to do is that the observer if the, somebody decides that they are going to choose a, a z axis which is tilted with respect to my z axis by through 20 degrees then they have to look at this also by rotating their neck through 20 degrees and everything looks exactly similar so this is what is what is meant by the implication of rotational invariance for physics and a incorrect understanding was by the greeks where they thought that the orbits will be necessarily circular it it plagued physics for quite some time but this is the correct understanding now along with equations of motion people had observed conservation of various kinematical quantities like this ballerina here she is uh, or ice skater this is ice skater she is skating and she is turning as she starts turning faster and faster she actually closes her hands and why does she do that we all know this that because the she wanted the moment of inertia because the angular momentum is product of moment of inertia times the angular velocity so that uh, this it's in rare this is unchanged the, that cannot change and to make sure that the motion at a higher velocity is possible she has to reduce her moment of inertia so the for example i take a simple pendulum the pendulum at the central position has only kinetic energy it oscillates here up to the maximum extreme position where it comes at rest where it has only the potential energy and no kinetic energy and then it back it comes here where it has only kinetic energy it keeps on moving and goes here again when it has only potential energy but the point is energy remains exactly the same provided we remove we reduce uh, we neglect frictional losses so linear momentum is conserved in the absence of a force this is actually follows from uh, uh, newton's uh, second law force is equal to mass into acceleration in the absence of a torque angular momentum is conserved and the total energy of a system in motion is also conserved and that is the con conservation uh, conversion of potential energy into kinetic energy into potential energy again now these were just observations the laws were empirical and nobody really knew do they always have to be true till a very important mathematician came on the scene and in 1918 which is now 103 years ago emi noether the mathematician par excellence but actually this is the only piece of work she did which was used by physicists i believe her work in mathematics pure mathematics is even more superb but i lack the ability to understand that but what she proved at one go is that for every symmetry operation generated by a continuous transformation you remember i told you there were continuous transformations there were discrete transformations and she was able to tell that associated with any continuous transformation there was a conserved quantity and depending on the operation you could tell what quantity would be should be conserved that if the system is invariant under a translation in space then it should mean that linear momentum is conserved if the equations of motion are invariant or have a rotational symmetry angular momentum should be conserved and if the equations of motion are invariant under a translation in time then the energy should be conserved so now here comes this lady 
By the way, she was the first woman PhD that was allowed to graduate with a PhD in uh, University of Erlangen. And, but there is a lot of, I mean, I could talk me know her for a full hour, but we just don't have that time. But I want you to appreciate the import of this particular theorem. What this theorem is really telling you that the conservation of linear momentum, conservation of angular momentum, conservation of energy, which had been observed empirically, people knew them to be true, actually have a basis in much more fundamental feature of the equations of motion. This is because the equations of motion are possess these three symmetries. And since they possess these three symmetries, these three quantities have got to be conserved, at least for the systems that one was looking at, angular momentum was conserved. Her theorem actually also removed an apparent contradiction that was there in general theory of relativity. Hilbert and Einstein were actually puzzled by the non-conservation of energy in general theory of relativity. And her theorem showed that there was nothing wrong with the conservation of energy. One, was, one small piece was missing from the coming from the space-time curvature and things were all okay. In fact, Pauli used the energy and the angular momentum conservation to postulate actually a new particle, neutrino. And this is the first example. And in particle physics, there are examples galore, which I will not go into, that a symmetry principle actually predicted the existence of a particle which was really very, very elusive and took decades to find. In fact, let me explain to you why that was desperation. In 1918, and mind you, when was this theorem? Just please look at this. She has proved this theorem in 1918. So till that time, people didn't know this deep relationship between the non-conservation of energy and symmetries. And here Chadwick noted an apparent violation of energy conservation in radioactive beta decay. There was a beta decay from bismuth 210 to polonium 210 and an electron was emitted and the electron had a continuous energy spectrum. And only here near the end, the energy of the electron was equal to energy difference between the bismuth 210 and polonium 210, which were independently known. And then the question was, what happens to the remaining energy when the electron has much less energy? And that is what was passed, hence Pauli postulated the existence of the neutrino. Now, Lorentz, now I want to go to a second invariance. Now that we have understood this relationship between transformations and invariances, let me go to the next step that there were things, it was known that it was found out by Lorentz that for a correct description of electromagnetic particles moving in electromagnetic fields or even the dynamic electromagnetic fields themselves, he had seen that the electric and the magnetic fields should transform in a certain fashion in frames which move with respect to each other in uniform motion. Then only Maxwell's equation will be right and will be independent of the position, state of motion of the observer. In fact, Maxwell's equations in free space tell you that the velocity of light is determined by the dielectric constant and the magnetic permeability of the medium, say vacuum, for example. So now comes the question is that how can the velocity of light depend on the state of motion of the observer? And if you had used only Galilean transformations to see how the electric and magnetic fields change, you would have found that the velocity would in fact depend upon uh, the uh, state of motion of the observable. And it is this, therefore one had to change the transformations of the space time under with respect to state of motion of the observer. And this is where uh, one actually got the relativistic transformations, the Lorentz transformations. That's what Lorentz found out. So what, we, what they found that the Maxwell's equations, which were known to be true, were inconsistent with Galilean transformation. But if the electric and magnetic fields, as well as the space time in the two frames, were related to each other via Lorentz transformations, then Maxwell's equations remained completely independent, completely unchanged. And now, of course, the great story comes 
that Maxwell's equations are therefore independent of the state of uniform motion of the observers, and that is they have the relativistic invariance. So the, here we found the right equations first, and then we found the correct symmetry, which is what I referred to earlier. And to understand the joy and the importance of this, let's just look at the statements which were made by Barkman, who was a great relativist or point current, who was a mathematician. So he says, these laws of physics, which express a basic invariance or symmetry of physical phenomena seem to be our most fundamental ones. They make the description of physical phenomena simpler, more compact, and hence more beautiful to a physicist. And then Poincaré goes on to say, the scientist does not study nature because it's useful, typical mathematician. He studies it because he takes pleasure in it, and he takes pleasure in it because it's beautiful. I agree with the sentence, except for the fact that he thinks that the scientist can only be a he, but we can pardon him for the age in which he lived. Now, I want, now I'm going to go somewhat faster but I want to now having explained to you how in some sense observation of you know, encapsulation of uh, underlying laws of electromagnetic fields in a particular equation that is Maxwell's equations actually also told us what the transformations, what was the right, what kind of symmetry did they have? And that is how we discovered the relativistic invariance so that is actually the beautiful uh, connection between symmetries and the laws of motion or the truth of laws of motion. So Dirac again happens to be another one of those mathematicians, uh, physicists who lived only by considerations of beauty. And he wanted to look at a quantum mechanical equation to describe an electron moving at relativistic speeds at atomic distance scales. And it has to give the same result for all observables. It needs to be relativistically invariant. That's what he wanted. And a very unexpected fallout came. He could immediately explain why the equation which connects magnetic moment of an electron with its spin angular momentum that uh, has a ratio, that is the ratio of the magnetic moment of the electron to the spin angular momentum. This ratio is two experimentally it's ma measured. And his equation said, that if relativistic invariance is to be true, then the free electron has to have this ratio equal to two. Not just that, it also predicted that there must exist in nature a particle which is exactly like an electron, except it has opposite charge. So this is a second example of an invariance. In this case, the relativistic invariance, which is a symmetry predicting a particle. So he predicted boldly that every fermion has to have an anti-fermion. And the, uh, Madame uh, Noether told us that there is a conservation law and the conservation law that is associated with this is the fermion number. Now I come to the last, essentially the last invariance that I will speak in detail about. And that has to do with now having told you about kinetic or what are called space-time invariances or symmetries. I now I go and try to, and I've already told you how the considerations of the space-time symmetries have actually ended up helping the development of particle physics by understanding why particles have the properties they have, why the electron has the aromagnetic ratio too, why do antiparticles exist? Because if the antiparticles didn't exist, world would not be relativistically invariant. So it's as simple as that that uh, antiparticle uh, existence is almost predicted based on this. So we can call, you know, let me think about a particle moving in an electromagnetic potential and you know, particle is falling through a potential difference uh, V, uh, delta V will gain energy E times V where is the charge on that electron. Now, if I call the potentials at two end, either V1 and V2 or V1 prime and V2 prime, such that V1 prime is related to V1 by addition of a constant, delta V will be still the same as a result of which nothing will change. So for the people who know a little bit, I can also say that Maxwell's equations in classical electromagnetism are unchanged under the change, the potential, the vector potential and the scalar potential, 
mu equal to zero is actually some way related to this vector potential and mu equal to one, two, three are the vector potentials, the three components of a vector potential. And if they transform in this fashion, in fact, nothing changes in the Maxwell's equation and believe it or not, this particular invari invariance under this transformation, this is very similar to the transformations that I was talking about, about rotations, reflections, except that these are transformations in these imaginary quantities, which are potentials. They are not physical measurables. They are not physical observables, but we are talking about their transformations. And this invariance of a theory, which are Maxwell's equations here, equations of motion. So invariance of equations of motion under such a transformation, we call it gauge invariance. And believe it or not, this gauge invariance is responsible for the fact that the Coulomb potential is one by R. And this is sort of very briefly explained in this slide, but I am really running out of time. So let me just uh, go through very quickly through this, that in a field language, we can say that the uh, potential that is charge Q2 seeds due to the charge Q1 can be understood in terms of the field lines and the potential is Q1, Q2 by R. On the other hand, in the field theory language, we say that the force between two particles is understood by exchange of a photon and that will again give rise to the same potential form in the non-relative stick limit Q1, Q2 by R. And the properties of the quantum that you exchange, which are spin or mass, these govern the nature of the force such as the range or the dependence on the distance of the potential. The potential V of R in general would be exponential minus MR times Q1, Q2 by R, where Q1, Q2 are the charges and M is the mass. Now, since we see that V of R is Q1, Q2 by R observed experimentally, we know that the mass of the photon better be zero. And in fact, when we write the equations of motion, we find that the invariance under these transformations also requires the mass of the photon to be zero. So the observed zero mass and the infinite range of the Coulomb potential get related to this gauge invariance. Now, this is all possible because of the wonderful knowledge that the studies of invariances in space-time symmetries that had been performed and the wonderful insight that has been offered to us by Noether's theorem. Now, standard model of particle physics is actually just an extension of this gauge invariant description of electromagnetic interactions. I will really not go through this. I don't even, I have no intentions. I don't have slides for that. But what I want to tell you is that the standard model of particle physics is actually a description of the fundamental, all the fundamental particles and interaction among them. And more importantly, we know that all these interactions are described as theories or in terms of equations of motion, if you like, which are invariant under transformations or which are symmetric under the transformation that is generated by a particular type of gauge transformation. And that is the funny name that you see here. These are different groups that describe those symmetry, symmetries. But again, we don't need to go into it. It is essentially ex extension of these kind of transformations that I've written here. But the whole point is that if we look at, so this is not always known, this was not always known. How did the particle physicists arrived at it? They arrived at it because they were looking at the different manifestations of this force. And when they looked at the force, that is the weak interaction, that they found that the weak interactions, in fact, have the force which is only felt inside the nucleus, which means that the weak interaction mediator, which in this case, when the photon was mediator, it was mass zero. So the range of it was infinity. In the case of weak interaction, since the mass of this object is large, the range is small, hence I uh, conclude that the mass is very large and now there is a problem. Weak interactions are short range. Therefore, these gauge, its corresponding gauge bosons are actually massive and they also violate parity. That is, they are not left-right symmetric. I already mentioned that to you. Now, that is the problem with the electronic interactions. They are short range and therefore the corresponding gauge bosons are massive. But if they are massive 
I told you earlier that there was this big connection between the mass of the photon being zero and the theory being gauge invariant. So now you have this problem that if the corresponding gauge bosons are massive, theory cannot be symmetric. The laws, force laws cannot be symmetric. Then you say, okay, go home. What, who told you that does the real laws of nature have to be symmetric? The problem was that all the measurements that were made to a very high degree of accuracy had told us that the laws of motion are really symmetric. So we had this problem. We had the non-zero mass of the WZ bosons, which indicate that the gauge symmetry is broken. And the major properties told us that it is actually not broken. So how can you have your cake and eat it also? That was where the sort of genius of Higgs had to come in. And I'm really not going to go through this because I am running out of time. But Higgs introduced a theoretical structure which will allow us to have our cake and eat it also. And that is where he invented a mechanism which can make the gaze bosons massive without breaking the symmetry. And that ended up predicting the existence of a spin zero particle. And it is this spin zero particle which gave the gauge boson their masses. And this is what is called spontaneous symmetry breaking, which was a mechanism which was invented by Nambu much before, uh, quite a long time before in you know, very general context. And he actually got the Nobel Prize for that in 2008. Then Weinberg and Salam actually used the Higgs mechanism. And then they showed how one can construct the part of the standard model, the electroweak part of the standard model with a gauge symmetry where the photons remain massless as they should, weak gauge bosons are massive and the entire symmetry is still kind of hidden from us. Electroweak symmetry is hidden from us, but it exists in all the measurements. And the root had to come through the interactions of this spin zero boson. Now in practice, I would have used a few slides to tell you how the Higgs boson also cures the other problem of the apparent you know, existence of only the left-handed electrons being emitted in uh, 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 beta decay. But I think I have run out of time, so I'm going to skip this. If people need, we will come back to this subject. But at the moment, what one can say is that if the theory, that is the standard model, had to have the gauge symmetries. So then the quantum formulation of the theory has to make sense. And for that, we really needed to check that it does make that sense. And in fact, experiments which were performed at the lab, which is the electron positron collider at CERN in Geneva, as well as that uh, at the Tevatron at Fermi Laboratory in Chicago in US, US, actually told us that this theory works. This theory is correct. And Mr. Higgs has told us that, and also not just Higgs, but also the formulation by Weinberg and Salam and Grashaw had together told us that if the electroweak symmetry uh, has to be realized in nature, then Higgs boson must exist. So, and since all these measurements at CERN as well as Formula showed us that the electroweak gauge symmetry is realized in nature, people actually spent a lot of money and efforts to construct the large electron, large hadron collider, and it did find the Higgs boson. So finally, people could come and this physicist here, she comes and says, we have discovered what nothingness is made up of. And the other one says, it's quite something. I hope you also agree with me that it's really quite something because you see the tenuous but very clear theoretical connections which had predicted that this Higgs boson should exist. And this was like, if the once the Higgs boson, the finding of the Higgs boson was like, you know, on a, uh, you build a castle of uh, cards, okay? And on the top of the top two cards had to balance, had to balance each other such that the entire uh, building can stay, the entire house of cards that we can build can stay. And this is what this discovery at the Large Hadron Collider did. And I hope at least to some extent, you have seen the wonderful, wonderful role that symmetry and understanding of symmetries and under symmetry breaking both have played a role. I have not explained completely the left-right symmetry breaking part in this, but other than that, 
I hope you see that, okay? So here I have taken a summary from a article of David Gross, where he says that we look at initial conditions, we measure physical phenomena, then we infer laws of nature, then we find their connections to the symmetry principles, and then we now try to extract all the uh, quantities that describe our system by looking at these laws of nature, which we have extracted from symmetry principles. Once again, having understood the connection between the laws of nature and the symmetry through this uh, earlier measurement. So that is really the full structure. Now, uh, Sam already prepared you for this, that we still need to extend the standard model. And there are some ways of extending it without with new symmetries. Some are ways with including some new symmetries. I have worked on something which is one way of extending the standard model using an additional symmetry called supersymmetry. And some of these things, for example, supersymmetric theories have had predictions which could be tested at the LHC. In fact, we had written this book long ago where we had pointed out what can be tested at the LHC. To our great chagrin, we still haven't found any evidence direct evidence so far for existence of supersymmetry and the, uh, the search still continues. But what I like, for example, is that the achievement of the entire 20th century particle physics can now be encapsulated in a single equation, which can fit on the back of a, a t-shirt. This happens to be a jacket which I bought in the Sun cafeteria. And now you see that this equation or this quantity is the quantity from which we would derive equations of motions, which give rise to all the forces that I talked about, for example, here, here, for example, or here, for example. And this is this understanding, this small cogent, coherent, short description of the laws of fundamental particles and the fundamental forces among them is possible only because of our understanding of symmetries and breaking of those symmetries. And where do we go forward? We like to go and look at the BSM through the properties of the two heavy particles, namely the top and the Higgs, which is what the Large Hadron Collider is doing now. So it is through this window that we are looking at the BSM land and maybe we will get lucky and we'll find something. And on the second theory frontier, which is what is you, which is where people at uh, ICTS and many other places are working very hard on also, is to add gravitation to this picture. And that is the next theory frontier where we uh, people are going on hunting for how to describe all the fundamental interactions. And that's where it is. Those of you who are interested, there is a list of books and essays that uh, I have provided. And in case ICTS keeps these slides on the website, you can actually have access to this reading material. Thank you very much for your patience. And I'm also very thankful that uh, we can take all the questions at the end. We have a large number of questions and I'm going to go over them one by one. The first question is from Matthias. Can you comment about slight deviations from perfect symmetry and why this is even more beautiful to us than perfect symmetries? For example, with respect to human faces or grooves in music, As I said, this is some, I mean, I, I think this is, a, that is why I tried to get away, get by by quoting Feynman, that we really, I think what we do see is that the smaller symmetries do take, breaking of symmetries do make things at times more beautiful. And I think we really don't have any sort of fundamental understanding why this happens. And I, the best understanding or best explanation I can give is what Feynman gave. I mean, I, I don't think I can do better than Feynman, where he said that maybe it is to make us aware of the perfection 
that a perfect symmetry has in some sense it brings it home to us even more i mean i, I think this is a philosophical question and i don't have any more deeper uh, insight to offer yeah uh, roini if i can add a poetic touch to that yes the, please do yeah. please do there's a quote from francis bacon which chandrashekar loves it's yeah. there is no excellent beauty which hath not some strangeness in the proportion actually i remember this i remember this yes thank you for thank you for quoting this yes 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 thanks it's a wonderful quote actually thanks uh, asan yeah the next one is from advait sadagankar are there end dimensional platonic solids i think what i understood uh, what do you exactly mean by that can you explain because i understood that plato essentially listed all the solids that we could have i mean are you thinking of a space which is n dimensional and yes, do we yes. think of solids in that n dimensional space yes, yes sure what could yes surely they are they, they can be defined because once you know the i mean that is where understanding the platonic solids solids in three dimensions three plus three dimensions in terms of the equations actually helps you to go on further and define these solids in other dimensions now uh, one more question from the same person advait sadegaonkar how do know the remove the anomaly of non conservation of energy from general theory of relativity yeah i knew this question was going to come so i tried to rush through it and again i don't think right now i don't have the necessary equations which i could display and explain it but what it briefly amounts is the following that the general theory of relativity basically relates the if you like the uh, mass or the force with space time curvature the two are sort of related and in the early equations people had okay technically people had forgotten to take into account the contribution to the energy momentum tensor which comes from that curvature itself and if you don't take the, take that into account energy happens to be one component of the energy momentum tensor and the energy looks apparently uh, non conserved but once you compute your energy momentum tensor correctly which is what you can do once you use noether's theorem where you find that you have to add the contribution coming from the space time curvature itself to that quantity i think this is the best i can explain without any more equations Uh, the next question is from shailaja d sharma ideal body perhaps needs to be defined is there such a thing this is in the context of leonardo da vinci's picture ah, ah, yeah, yeah 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 now I, i guess these kind of pictures where to draw to say that how different people thought of an ideal what is ideal and in some sense what one is showing here is that the great thinkers of the past when they didn't have i mean these are people who are postulating what should be our ideal thing according to them so as it happens the actual proportions are somewhat close to that but i think this is to my mind it a philosopher theorizing what is our ideal thing what i wanted to show is that if you look at that shape and look at how symmetrical it was that symmetry is something which had been a driving force which affected people's thinking to say what is beautiful and what is ideal symmetry formed a basis on which people postulated these things i don't know if again i have answered her question but this is what i wanted to uh, say when i mentioned it the next question is from rajeshri rajesh umbarkar the question is is it that for our eyes symmetric object or figures are more pleasing is it sorry is it that we find symmetric objects more pleasing huh. it is it does right i mean we see at least to many of our people most of the common people when you see a picture which has some obvious symmetry then indeed it looks uh, much nicer it's much more pleasing i mean look at a picture where uh, that's why i showed you these various pictures and if you had a uh, you know if any if you had, I, actually i can even say that if you had a human body which was not symmetric it doesn't look pleasing to the eye at all 
So symmetry is almost un undeniably more beautiful, at least in natural objects. So I don't know what the question really means, to be honest. Uh, the and next question, the next question is from Pran Pranjul Kumar. Huh. Uh, I'm afraid I don't understand it. Perhaps you will. Which has more yeah. existence, symmetry or not symmetry? I guess uh, what this is my judgment. I'm trying to guess what he means. He or she, I don't know. Is a he or she? I don't know. I don't. Know. But uh, no. So the point is, I guess uh, what. Uh, uh, what you have to see in nature, do I see, do I tend to see more often symmetric objects than non-symmetric objects? So for example, has evolution produced, for example, I mean, evolution has produced animals which are symmetric. There are a few animals which are, you know, which are not symmetric, but there are some very specific reason. That is for the purpose for which, for some purposes, we might want to build something that is obviously asymmetric. That is obviously not symmetric. But by and large, most of the time, most of the things natural, then they evolve. There is a certain symmetry that shapes and all the bodies and animals do have. And we don't know the reasons for that again. But that while actually discusses how gravitation itself may have played a role in, and the fact that we move particular direction uh, may have had a role uh, to play in uh, development of uh, bodies. And I think biologists do discuss evolution of shapes and they also find symmetric shapes more often than not. That's uh, about uh, all I can say. Yeah, the next question is from Mita Das. Objects mm -hmm. following Fibonacci series also satisfy aesthetics. Is yes. that due to our perception or recognition by our brain? Well, yeah. I am not a cognition expert, <laughs> so I would refuse to answer this question. <laughs> I mean, it just looks beautiful, that much we can say. The Fibonacci figures that are generated by Fibonacci sequences are absolutely wonderful. But now, I don't know what our eyes react to. I, I don't have enough knowledge on such yeah. things. And actually, sunflowers have both Fibonacci series and some kind of spiral symmetry inside the seeds, the arrangement of the seeds. That is why I jokingly gave this example of uh, Panth Pujara and Panth <laughs> Washington Sundar. But I mean, very often, sometimes it's not so. There are combinations of symmetries yes. also. But why symmetric things look beautiful, I really don't think I have an answer. Maybe cognition experts look at it and have some specific answer to the question. But I don't. The next question is from Ravi Atale. Probably Atale. Atale, Atale, Ravi Atale. Atale, Atale. But yeah. more generally, if the universe had perfect translational invariance, there is perfect homogeneity and isotropy, will space exist? I know, see, I think I should have, uh, it's a good question in some sense. I should have actually said very specifically that when I'm talking of this uniformity of space, you have to, you know, if you obviously look at, say, if you take a big box, and you look at a gas molecule which is close to the edge of the box, then clearly that gas molecule is going to feel something different than a gas molecule that is at the center. So when you talk of translational invariance of systems and so on and so forth, you actually have to look at two systems which are identical. So that's the first answer. And the second answer is that I do believe that again in the, the just like, I mean, in the early universe, things were really uniformly distributed. And what provided the nuclei of, you know, concentrations for matter to fall in and form structures, they were some kind of a nucleation centers. These were to some extent uh, accidental things that happened. And once, of course, then you can understand once the center is provided, how structures will grow. But if you look at, for example, something like black, uh, black body radiation, you will find it's really uniform, right? And it's all because of all structure formations that we have small anisotropies. So I think there is no inconsistency between our existence and the laws of inver in invariance and of laws of nature under translation. 
The next question is by is from Nitish Anirao. Why does nature produce left and right-handed stru structures, chiral structures, e.g. in shells? He's, yeah. He, he, again, as I said, the only way we understand, or as a physicist or a chemist, as a, as a structural whatever person who is trying to compute these things from first principles, what one can do, for example, I will take the case of ma chemical molecules, because that's somewhat easy to uh, sort of explain, that people can do the energetics calculations. And people can see what arrangement of molecules, which will minimize <laughs> the total energy. And that is the principle on which you can decide what combinations will be stable. And as it happens, the laws that govern these formations are essentially, you know, the forces are essentially electromagnetic in nature. And since these laws don't have a left versus right preference, when I compute these structures, the stereochemistry, I would actually find that both structures are chemically stable. Now, why nature chose to produce in proteins, living matter, only the left amino acids is a mystery that I think nobody understands. People, very good minds actually try to solve it. And one of the answers that is given there is indeed what I just now said. That in principle, what you would think is that since the structure formations are governed by the basic rules of uh, attraction, repulsion of essentially forces, which are derived from Coulomb forces, in the structural formation, there will not be a preference over left versus right. So stability will allow you both. Now, shells of both sides, slides therefore should be produced what the surprise is more when you find that only one type of amino acids exist in nature. Actually, the surprise is when you see only one type existent. Surprise is not why you produce both types. I hope I have tried to give uh, answer to your question. Uh, the next question is from Srikant N. Not clear what is handedness in amino acids. Could you please explain that? Ah, the, that I can go. Can I go? Okay, let me try to go to my file because that picture ind indicates that very well. Let me see how I can, sh yeah. Uh, can you show my slide? Get my slides Anupam? again there? Anupam, Anupam can you get my slides yeah. there again? So, yeah. yeah. It, it will take some time, Professor Rohini. You could, if you have the slide <laughs> in front of you, you can share it. Yeah, I'm I, it is in front of me and I will share. One moment. Yeah, I will share. Will so wait, I have yeah. to just share once again. Okay. Give me yeah. a minute. I will come to that slide and then, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So let me share one moment. Uh, share screen. Yeah. So you see here, these are two molecules, okay? And that is why I have written this, that the relative arrangement of the hydrogen, this COOH, NH2, and this radical. In these two things, two pictures, you will see that in these are two molecules. Okay, same. I mean, it is the same, comp, same, same atoms. Okay, uh, that are connected, same radicals that are uh, that are forming the element. So it's the same thing, same compound, but this compound has a different arrangement of the different components that make it than this molecule. So the stereo arrangement of these different molecules. In one case, when I rotate it, for example, the bond goes in the plane, in other case, so left-handed, and in the other case, it's the right-handed. So it is the relative arrangement, stereo arrangement of these molecules, which is different, if you see. And it is that, that is this sense of rotation is different in the two cases. And that's exactly what is being said, that this, what you see in nature is one of the two. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from Sangeeta S. Question mm -hmm. is, what is meant by accidental? Was the disturbance the cause for symmetry breaking? Uh, no, accidental, 
what i wanted to explain was the fact is that why in the, when i mean we really we are talking about things here for which many of us don't have any answers is how did that life form that is how did these original molecules which now form life were formed so what one is saying is that one explanation is to why all naturally occurring uh, what life that we see all the proteins that we are made up of contain only left amino acids the reason might be a little bit like the example that i gave you namely that if you have uh, ants walking on a path and the first ant took the left path and therefore they keep on going uh, in the left direction it is in that sense that this is a accidental choice between the two directions the physics or chemical i mean scientific physics reasons or physical reason for all the molecules that are present naturally being left handed then then it should not have been possible to synthesize the right handed molecule so there are no fundamental principles which forbid formation of the right handed molecule but in life you see only nature you see only the left handed molecules and that is in some sense a accidental uh, story this is like the first ant taking the left fork and we really don't understand that and as i said there are people who actually think about it quite a lot i remember the late uh, uh, professor uh, n kumar used to talk to us about this and tell us that maybe the weak interaction parity violation has something to do with it but i really don't think that one has a clear understanding and in that sense this is a accidental uh, occurrence so it's not really breaking of the symmetry but it's just accident that we see only left amino acids in life the next question is from ojan fenersi any book advice any book i have given the books at the end of my talk and they are wonderful books and you can look at them so again i can project them on the screen if i i thought i did but if i no, didn't no, let I, me we, we'll put it up on the website i think we'll put it yeah. on the website yeah so the last two pages uh, of my talk actually contain advice for good reading material our next question is from debajyoti balla can we mm -hmm. find the gauge symmetry for the graviton in the context of conservation principle and gravitational attraction yes, is there any book of symmetry in the context of gravitational attraction not that we know of not that we know of just like electrodynamics we know the gauge symmetry is not broken indeed i think for the gravitation if we were to describe it as a transformation of the coordinates themselves that can be understood uh, under a transformation position dependent local transformations of the coordinates and i do not believe that there is evidence for any symmetry breaking there okay, the next question is from krishna deshmukh are there any symmetries in probability or statistical math mathematics i i'm sure there are applications of symmetry principles to which will ease out analysis in the statistical theory sometimes because these are mathematical ideas which would be helpful but i am not aware of quoting anything that i can tell you immediately uh, how they can be used but i'm reasonably sure that as a branch of mathematics the ideas in group theory would well solve give some uh, uh, handle to uh, handle issues in statistics and probability theory because i gave you one example that the idea of symmetry of mathematical equations actually helped people to understand the zeros of a polynomial i mean so it's kind of uh, possible but i don't know the answer next question is from prayash malik i have a question how matter and antimatter symmetry breaking took place uh, or how relativistic invariance came up uh, the relativistic invariance i think i tried to explain but i will repeat it again is that maxwell's equations were derived from through a lot of observations of electromagnetic phenomena 
and those equations were actually first written in terms of electric and magnetic fields we know them as faraday's law biot-savart's law so on and so forth now one realized that when they were synthesized into a single set of equations called what we know as maxwell's equations that for free space in the the velocity of the electromagnetic propagation of an electromagnetic wave will be simply given by 1 over 4 pi epsilon not mu not where epsilon not and mu not are the directed constant and magnetic permeability of vacuum so if that is the case then the equations this particular observation told us that velocity of light cannot depend on the observer's uh, state of motion because this equation this depended only on the medium and if you use the galilean transformations one would have seen that the velocity of light should depend on the state of motion of the observer so the relativistic invariance or lorentz transformations were actually suggested by lorentz lorentz transformations were suggested by lorentz for the for earlier but he missed the point and which was what came was then put forward by, explained to us by both poincare and uh, einstein that this is what these transformations are indeed what keep the velocity of light constant and that is the relativistic invariance that one was talking about so this is the first part of the question the i forgot the other one sam can you remind me what the other one was um how did uh, matter versus antimatter ah yeah no that's so much that's more complicated that indeed uh, as we see the again the same laws of motion of the fundamental particles if we look at them we see that uh, they are actually symmetric under a change of a particle to an antiparticle which means that in the early universe which was only like radiation you produced particles and antiparticles in equal numbers now what has happened is that today's universe at least in our universe where we find ourselves we are dominated by matter and one has actually made precision decision measurements of the uh, number of matter particles minus the number of antimatter particles actually it's more baryons and antibaryons and divide it by the total number of photons in the universe and you find that this now this is a very very small number which at the beginning of the universe must have been equal so now there here is comes the problem is that how did matter start dominating over antimatter and i believe not i believe i can say this that we still don't understand completely how that has come to happen but there was a very famous uh physicist a russian physicist who actually told us how this could happen in principle and for that it's a, his name was sakharov by the way i should tell you his name and he actually postulated that if in the early universe three different conditions existed then indeed it would be possible to understand how matter dominates over antimatter today i would not go into the details of those conditions but one of the conditions is that there should be an asymmetry between matter and antimatter in the laws of fundamental particles and indeed in the standard model there exists such a small amount of asymmetry this has been actually this is called asymmetry what is called cp asymmetry and this cp asymmetry was actually measured first and then one understood that you had to make sure that the standard model framework can actually accommodate it can describe it and right now what we find is that standard model can qualitatively explain why the baryon anti baryon asymmetry exists but quantitatively we still cannot explain and this in fact is one of the big crack that sam was mentioning this is one big question that's there in front of all of us and if anybody gets an answer i'm sure they will go to stockholm immediately 
The next question is from Sanjay. Why mirror doesn't reflect top and down instead of left and right? It depends on which mirror you, if you which axis you keep your mirror parallel to, no? I mean, mirror reflection is about a plane. If I put a mirror like this, I will reflect top and down. If I keep my mirror horizontally, it's normal to it. So I, again, I think it's... Yeah, let's go on to the next question from Vivek Janardana. How and whether symmetry is demonstrated by time? Because time flows only in one direction. So symmetry yeah. might not encompass time. Ah, okay. Again, people are asking questions which are not easy to answer in an armchair, all right. But the point is that when you talk about, people do talk about time reversal symmetry, okay, of laws of, uh, of equations of motion. And here, what you are really talking about is that it's a slightly different concept here. Here, you're really talking that if you looked at a collision of particles, which are coming, two particles which are coming and going out again. And if you were able to run the film backwards, what would happen? That is a different question than the kind of question that you are asking, that the arrow of time is in unidirectional. So these two are slightly different ways, different things that we are talking about. They're not even the same. And the time reversal asymmetry that we very often talk about actually is about constructing objects or observables which are formally will change sign under this operation in our theory when we are computing things. And then you would look whether, for example, whether objects have uh, electric dipole moment and so uh, neutral objects have electric dipole moment and so on and so forth. And those are very different kettle of fish which I wouldn't want to go into right now. But that's a different story. And that time reversal that one talks about is quite different than this unilateral, unidirectional flow of time that we are familiar with. Yeah, there's a large number of questions. I'll have to skip a few of them. But okay. let me ask one from Daya Rani. What is actual spin? What is its physical significance? I will direct you to a very wonderful book by Tomanaga. <laughs> No, okay. I mean, this is a flippant answer. I think the point is that this is a concept with which I think many of us struggle the first time we come across it because we are familiar with a spin of an object that's orbiting. Angular momentum is something that you can understand. Now, what is meant by saying that an electron has a spin? The only sense in which I can explain it by saying that if I put an electron in a magnetic field and I look at the energy, for example, an electron exists in an atom and I'm looking at the energy levels of an electron in an atom, but I put the thing in a magnetic field, then because of the magnetic field, the energy level will actually split into two parts and one in which the electron will have spin parallel to the direction of the magnetic field and the other one in which the electron will have a spin opposite. But what is meant by that, that the interaction energy of the electron will have a component, which is basically the magnetic moment of the electron times the magnetic field. And that magnetic moment of the electron is actually related to the spin of the electron. So in this question, I would actually say that I'm talking about the magnetic moment and I'm saying that that evidence, the fact that the electron has a magnetic moment, I am using it to infer that electron has a spin that is associated with it. And that is just there. It is not due to any motion. Uh, you know, it's just the property that the electron has and it manifests itself for example, in its interaction with magnetic fields. I um, guess this is the best answer I can give. Uh, next question is from Meghna, quite a nice one. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that when we look for symmetry and beauty in the laws of nature, we might miss out 
on some important laws which may not be symmetrical? Mm -hmm. No, actually, I think it's a wonderful question. And in fact, uh, I think uh, uh, this is, a, I can tell you a story here that the parity violation, which is the left-right asymmetry of weak interaction, was in fact such a thing which was missed for a long time. What had happened was that particle physicists had, I mean, your, your question is completely well taken and yes, we could miss things. And that is why one has to keep an open mind and one has to look at things again and again. But at the same time, uh, so I, I, I want to give you an example of the weak interactions that at the time, uh, Yang and Lee, these are two theorists who actually postulated that left-right symmetry may be broken in weak interactions actually looked at, you know, there was to be a puzzle at that time that was called a tau theta puzzle, that a particle seemed to be decaying into final states, which had even parity as well as odd parity. And that was really confusing to people because still then they had seen at the decays of all possible particles and parity and interactions, and they had tested and they had seen that always conserved. And therefore, one had taken it for granted that parity is always conserved by all interactions. And these two gentlemen, they were very young, not most probably not unlike you, Megana. They were only at maybe 20, uh, in their 20, early 25 or something. And these two people said, let us look in the literature. Is there any evidence that weak interactions are left-right symmetric? And they combed all the data and they came to the conclusion that nobody had studied specifically whether left-right symmetry was a symmetry of weak interaction. So then they went on and suggested specific experiments, which were then, and this specific experiment was simply to look at the decay of a nucleus whose spin was polarized in a certain direction, which means that you chose a direction, okay? And now you looked at what is the number of electrons that are emitted as you change the magnetic field being parallel to the nuclear spin and anti-parallel to the nuclear spin. And in principle, there should not have been any difference, but indeed, because weak interactions violated parity, there was a complete uh, you know, big uh, difference. And people actually found that parity is violated and not only it is violated, but it is violated as much as it could be. So indeed, one has to keep a very open mind and one has, to, and people have done this and that's how the so-called CP violation was also discovered. That also came through the looking for, uh, checking whether the symmetries are perfect. However, right now, what we know, and I think here is most of my theory friends would agree with me, that very famous uh, people, and not just famous, but very intelligent people who formulated quantum field theories have actually proved that as long as we use quantum field theories, local quantum field theories, P symmetry, L, that is the reflection symmetry could be violated. The charge symmetry could be violated. Time reversal symmetry could be violated. But the product of all these three seems to be, it seems to be impossible to construct theoretically any violation, uh, any theory which violates the product of these three symmetries. And that's where it stands now. But the question is completely correct. And indeed people have worked on both parity violation as well as CP violation. And as I explained, the understanding of baryon as baryon antisymmetry requires CP violation and hence the time reversal violation of this. Yeah, I'm going to skip the next few questions because they were addressed in some form earlier. Hmm. Uh, question I come to is from Neil. Which symmetry corresponds to the invariance of speed of light in vacuum? It is uh, the variance with respect to the state of the observer. So it's a relativistic invariance. Yeah. And one question from Vrinda. Question is about randomness and symmetry. If you have a system that's completely random, can't we find infinite patterns? 
and can actually, we call that's these again a very very good question actually yeah, i would say that that's a extremely good question and uh, this is about uh, finding uh, uh, generation of complexity from you know from randomness but i don't think it has uh, to i mean for example fractal fractals which are generated also they are extremely beautiful patterns and they are generated because of random choices at each uh, splitting for example so this is a very interesting subject and the, i think they are also beautiful and we call them beautiful we, we don't call them not, not beautiful so there is beauty in randomness as well so another question from priyoda i think we'll have to take just a few questions now dear ma'am yeah. why do we emphasize so much on vector potential what are the major uses of it ah uh, no i just use vector potential because that was a easy way for me to introduce the gauge invariance for people who may not have otherwise known much about it but the important point is that if you look at the maxwell equations if you look at the description of electromagnetism the whole point is that if you can get a whole class of potential say i let me take the example again of the scalar potential because that's easy to get easy to see that if i change my scalar potential by a constant then electric fields corresponding to that potential do not change so there is exists a whole class of vector potentials or whole class of uh, magnet vector potentials all of which correspond to the same electric and magnetic fields and it is this electric and magnetic fields that we actually measure are by motions of particles and that is the ones in terms of which we describe the force on the charged particles so there is this infinite symmetry there is this infinite class of potentials and that is this beautiful gauge invariance and the fact that it is related so in some sense the fields are more fundamental the, the potentials are more fundamental than the electric and magnetic fields and that's why i focused on that because the symmetry is seen in terms of potentials and not in terms of the electric and magnetic fields yeah i think we'll have to stop on the questions now because we're running out of time but let me just add one yes. comment and one announcement the comment is that if you look at birds sitting on an electrical wire they don't get electrocuted because of gauge invariance but <laughs> two wires if that two wires they're dead right that's good example good example good good one sam <laughs> uh, the announcement is that uh, well let us uh, uh, i want to just make the announcement about the next copy with curiosity that is on sunday february 21st at 4 pm ist and it's about climate change why climate change is a wicked problem and the uh, talk is being given by ragu murtu gudde oh i see yeah okay. and uh, before we close we just have to close for time because i think we could go on forever given the number of questions we have here what i'd like to do is to thank rohini for a wonderful talk and let's all unmute and give her a hand yeah. <laughs> thank you rohini thank you so much thank you rukmini thank you okay then sirs i think i shall yeah thank okay. you bid goodbye yeah and you need a cup of tea now after having uh, yes after i think questions. i yes. i still have a little bit of tea here so thanks again for doing a great job and thanks for reminding me of that bacon uh, francis bacon saying i i knew it and it's a wonderful one yeah, so yeah. thanks yeah. thanks for reminding me of that yeah. okay Okay nice to see you again after a long time bye I know so please take care bye 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 everybody